Okay, so welcome, Eleanor, and over to you to hear all about uh, York Disability Rights Forum. As they say, disability rights are human rights. The York Disability Rights Forum is a group of people who identify as disabled, the members, and supporters who do not identify as disabled, the allies. The objects of the group are to advance the human rights of disabled people, their families and carers in the York area, and to foster contact, mutual understanding and cooperation between people with a range of disabilities in York and the surrounding area. Um, it's perhaps worth commenting that I grew up as a visually impaired person. I got to know quite a lot about visual disabilities, but it wasn't until I found myself in groups with other disabled people that I began to learn about other disabilities. Up till then, I've been as ignorant as many people who do not identify as disabled, and I'm still learning. What is disability? Well, the definition used in the census is that it is a condition lasting 12 months or more, which affects a person's ability to carry out everyday activities. On that definition, the overall proportion of people in Britain who identify as disabled is about one in five, perhaps slightly more. It's higher among older people. It's slightly higher in deprived areas. Now, every disability, every person with a disability is different. We are all unique individuals, but for some purposes, it is helpful to group disabilities. And I suggest six major groupings, which can, of course, be subdivided. There are the sensory disabilities, principally loss of sight and or hearing. The physical disabilities involving difficulty in walking, handling, bending, in neurodivergence, we hear a lot more about that recently, and that would include people with cognitive impairments, dyslexia, that sort of thing, people on the autism spectrum, and also some people with learning disabilities and some people with brain injury. These are people whose brains are wired a bit differently from those of the rest of us. Sometimes that is an advantage, sometimes it's a disadvantage. Then we have the psychological conditions, things like schizophrenia at one extreme, bipolar disorder, but also including anxiety and depression, which seem to be becoming very common. Then we have the low energy conditions, including long COVID. COVID has drawn public attention to these conditions, but they existed before. Some of them are not properly diagnosed. Some of them are thought to be post-viral. And the main symptom is a chronic and debilitating lack of energy. Sufferers can often do quite a lot, but having done it, they're exhausted and can't do anything for a while. 
And finally, we have the metabolic conditions, things like heart disease and diabetes, which can restrict a person's ability to carry out everyday activities. You may have noticed that most of these disabilities are invisible. The physical disabilities are generally visible and some of the sensory and some of the learning disabilities, most of the rest are not immediately visible. It's reckoned that something like 80% of disabled people have invisible disabilities, which is something that the public is only just beginning to realise. It's also significant that each of the disability groups has many subdivisions and even within one subdivision, needs can vary quite a lot. For example, the needs of a partially sighted person differ significantly from my needs as a totally blind person. Okay, so far. Mm -hmm. So, I'll look at some of the ways in which society has looked at disability and continues to look at it. What we call models of disability. The oldest model, which you still find in some faith groups, is that Disability is a consequence of sin. <laughs> it's usually taken to be the disabled person who has sinned, sometimes the disabled person's parents. And depending on your definition of sin, that may sometimes be true, but it seems to me more important to consider the fact that a lot of disability is the result of crime and violent conflict. And in these cases, it's usually not the disabled person who has committed the violence. In Gaza at the moment, we reckon that almost the whole population is disabled through lack of food, lack of clean water, deafness due to bombardments, post-traumatic stress disorder, and whatever else. The dominant model at the moment is the medical model. In this model, we see the disabled person as having something wrong with them that needs to be healed in order that the disabled person can become normal or normal enough to join in the rest of society. Society doesn't have to change. It's a disabled person who has to change or be changed. Then we have the charity model, which I would say was at its zenith in the Victorian period, but is still around today, and for some purposes is useful. In that model, the disabled person is treated as an object of pity, someone unfortunate, helpless, in need of financial assistance probably, and help given by well-meaning individuals and organizations. The trouble with that is that often there is a mismatch between the help offered and the help needed. The disabled person is not given rights in that model. Then we come to the social model of disability, 
which was developed by disabled people about 50 years ago. And it is the reverse of the medical model. And the people who developed it and their immediate followers found it empowering because in the social model, we say it's society that puts barriers in the way of disabled people. It's not the disabled person that needs to change, it's society. I'll give you some examples in a moment, but those two, the medical and the social model, are opposites. And finally, we come to the human rights model, which is the one that the York Disability Rights Forum uses. Now, you may be aware that York is a human rights city, and there is a Department of Human Rights at the university, and the York Disability Rights Forum actually grew out of that. You may associate human rights with faraway countries where people are liable to suffer torture, imprisonment without trial. They can't say what they like. They're not free to meet in public places, that sort of thing. But the scope of human rights is wider than that. A survey was done two or three years ago offering citizens of York a list of human rights and asking them to pick out the ones that they thought most relevant to their life in York. And I'll tell you the top five. I'm not sure if I've got the order right, but these were the top five. Housing, healthcare, education, a decent income, freedom from discrimination. All those are relevant to the lives of disabled people and particularly freedom from discrimination. Uh, I think I'll go on now to tell you a little bit about what the York Disability Rights Forum has been doing lately and come back to the models of disability afterwards. So, we are very much involved with campaigns for improving physical access, notably for blue badge holders. You may have been aware that for a while, blue badge holders could not park. Mm -hmm. And a coalition of organizations um, was formed called uh, Reverse the Ban, the York Disability Rights Forum was in that, and a great deal of effort was put, it, put into changing that situation. It nearly came to court, it, it didn't in the end, and the situation is now better. It's not ideal, but there are ways in and out of the city through staffed barriers. The difficulty is that central government thinks that York is a target for terrorists. We in York are not quite so sure about that, but uh, it's been a matter of trying to find a compromise to enable at least some blue badge access and at the same time maintaining a standard of safety. In the past year or two, there has been an upsurge of interest and awareness in the field of neurodivergence. And we actually have a neurodivergent subgroup in the York Disability Rights Forum. Now, people who are or think they may be neurodivergent 
want assessments. They want a diagnosis. Having a diagnosis can be quite helpful for a child. It can get you an education and health plan. For an adult in work, it might get you access to work. It's a, a government scheme. And it does change the way that people relate to you. If you know that somebody's on the autistic spectrum, you can perhaps make allowances that you might not otherwise make. However, the rules for getting assessments have been tightened up greatly. It's very difficult to get one unless there is an immediate risk to, to life or safety, which is not the case for most neurodivergent people. What they've been asked to do is to go online and use something called the Do It Profiler, which some of them find difficult to use and which was in any case not designed for the purpose. People in the York Disability Rights Forum have been working very hard to try to change this, so far with little success. So effort is now being switched to supporting people during their very long waits for assessments. This is particularly important for parents of neurodivergent teenagers. Something that York Disability Rights Forum did last year, which was such a success that we're doing it again this year, is to run a pride event your pride is great if you're able-bodied, but if you are seriously challenged by noise and crowds, or if you have certain mobility difficulties, it's not very accessible. And so your Disability Rights Forum has run, and will run again this year, Quiet Pride at St. John's University, where there will be I believe dance, yoga, workshops, various things. A way of celebrating pride that is accessible to some of the disabled people who don't really fit in in uh, the, the major event. Another thing that we've been doing is working with North Yorkshire on disability hate crime which is an unfortunate fact of life, particularly for people with physical disabilities and some learning disabilities. Visually impaired people don't get it very often, but they do get it sometimes. Most of the abuse is verbal. Sometimes it's physical. And one of the things that can be done about it is to track it and improve mechanisms for reporting it, which is now being done. Some students have brought out a report about how third party organizations can more easily report disability hate crime. And North Yorkshire now has four police officers instead of two devoted to disability hate crime. Right. I should say at this point that the Disability Rights Forum is always looking for more members and allies. Um, some of you may already be receiving their newsletter. I've seen some of their material quoted in yours. Mm -hmm. And for existing members and allies to become more involved, either by joining subgroups such as the Access Group and the Neurodivergent Group, or indeed eventually joining the Steering Group. Allies don't normally have voting rights, but in every other way they contribute in the same way as members and in fact we wouldn't be able to manage without them as well as we do. Right. 
Let me give you a couple of examples of medical versus social models of disability. A wheelchair user confronting a step. Medical model says he should have a prosthesis or he should have physiotherapy to make his legs stronger. The social model says there should be a ramp. A woman disabled by anxiety. The medical model says she should pull herself together or get something from her doctor. The social model says if her bus to work were more reliable and her boss didn't threaten to sack her every time she was late, she might not be quite so anxious. We believe that a lot of the recent rise in anxiety and depression is due to social factors. Now, those examples were pretty clear cut. Um, the scenarios that we're going to look at are less clear cut. There is scope for discussion. The medical model and social model are not mutually exclusive. Quite often, there's a bit of both involved. So in the examples, I would say there are no definitely right or wrong answers. Some scenarios do point more strongly in one direction than the other. But the main purpose of the exercise is just to get you talking and thinking about disability. Um, I would suggest about 10 minutes. There are six scenarios. It doesn't matter if you don't get through them all. And since there are so few of us, I could join in the discussion and think that would be helpful. So now I am, have got the scenarios up. And what I'll do is uh, add this to the recording by reading out the scenarios so that Everybody can, if they can't read them, can actually hear them. So the first thing that happens, the first scenario for you to consider is that Mary fell on the step on her way back from having an injection in her eye. Secondly, shortly after starting work, Chris lost his hand in an industrial accident. He won compensation and was persuaded to go back to work, to college. He now has an office job and a prosthetic hand that works quite well. Is that medical or social model? Thirdly, Anne has chronic bronchitis. The doctor says she might be better if her house were not so damp, but she can't afford to do much about that. <laughs> so um, how, what on earth is she going to do? Going to have chronic bronchitis forever and ever. Okay, number four, young Peter has usually good hearing. Unusually. Unusually <laughs> good hearing. Unusually good hearing. He is learning the violin and doing very well, but loud noise upsets him. His parents worry that he will be left out when he's older and his friends want to go to discos, parties, football matches or pop concerts. Number five, Joan is taking a lot of tablets. She's not sure what they all do and some of them look very similar. She sits down every week and tries to sort them out, but sometimes she gets into a muddle and this worries her. I'm not surprised. Okay, and number six, Robert in his eighties has prostate cancer. He talks about this quite openly and cheerfully. He says, it's just one of those things that come with old age. Something else would probably get me first. <laughs> oh, dear, lovely. 
Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording now and give us time to consider these very um, challenging situations. <laughs>